Hello, and welcome to The Workflow Show, where we provide some workflow therapy and offer a rare level of passion and understanding in the design, development, deployment, and maintenance of secure, high-performance media asset management solutions. Howdy, folks. Ben Kilberg, Senior Solutions Architect with Chesapeake Systems. And I'm Jason Whetstone, Senior Workflow Engineer and Automation Developer, also at Chesapeake Systems. So how's it going today, Ben? I am well, my friend. How about yourself? Doing pretty well. We're having some really great warm weather here in our area, so I'm, I'm happy for that because it's been kind of cold and dreary lately. Yep. So listeners, hello and welcome. Today's episode, we will be covering Media and Entertainment Basics Part 2, which is storage. We're going to focus on storage. Um, and this is uh, the second episode in our series about Media and Entertainment Basics. The first episode was on ingest, and if you haven't caught that yet, please go back and give that a listen. Today we're going to talk about storage, and we're going to talk about the different types of storage and what the benefits are to those different types of storage. We're going to talk about some of the newest technologies and compare and contrast those with older technologies that are still around and still heavily in use today. We're going to sort of stack them up and talk about why you would want one versus the other, some of the challenges and difficulties that sort of uh, surround those, and uh, kind of get into the weeds a little bit about uh, what makes these different storage technologies cool. So before we get into that, though, we have a few quick things that we want you to hear. So first, you can reach out to us directly with questions and thoughts on anything we have here on the Workflow Show at workflowshow at chessa.com. And we're trying to get to know you, our audience, a little bit better. So we'd like to know how you found out about the Workflow Show because that helps us reach out to more people and build an idea of who our listeners are so we can make the episodes geared towards what our audience wants. And we also really want to thank SVG News for writing about the Workflow Show. That's really great, guys. You can find a link to the article in our episode notes. So, without further ado, let's get on with storage. Why would we want to talk about storage, Ben? Like, what's the big deal? Storage is probably the most essential component um, in that it is the working volume that you live off of. It's where all of your files live. It's what you live and breathe. It's your internal hard drive on your laptop. It is the sword with which you live and die by in the uh, media creation world. Okay. So we would want to be educating our listeners on things like, um, I don't know, why you can't edit off of the company file server or maybe why that's not such a great idea. Or, or why it's going to make um, everybody really, really mad when you try. <laughs> sure. Okay. Maybe why, uh, why we can't just mount something from the cloud and edit off of that. Some, right. You know, just s- sort of setting up some expectations on on uh, on storage, all the different kinds of storage. We've got cloud storage, we have on-premise storage, we have file systems. And by the way, we do have a really great episode, one of the uh, legacy episodes from Workflow Show's past on uh, what a file system is. And our guest on that was our own Brian Suma. Mm. Um, he is a genius. You guys should listen to that if you have not. Yes. Uh, but anyway, back to our discussion today. So. When we talk about storage and just sort of the basics, let's talk about how files are stored. So we've got the file data, which is the actual bits that are in the file. And then we've got metadata, right? I mean, we're not talking about like metadata that's in a MAM or, you know, is this a shot with this actor in it or whatever. We're we're really talking about um, where the data starts and where it ends on the storage, right? Right. I always think of it as a pirate treasure map right? You've got whatever the disk is that you're working with. It could be the internal disk on your hard drive, um, in your laptop. It could be a giant spinning NAS or sand volume. It could be object storage, wherever it is. The metadata is what tells you where it is and also probably what it's named or perhaps it's a unique identifier pointing to that chunk of data. Maybe when it was uh, created and modified last. Yep. Yeah. Right. All cool. sorts of um, extended attributes as they call them. So that that's not necessarily part of the file itself, though. That's that's just data about the file or data about the data, really, right? Yep, you got it, right. So um, also maybe who gets access to it, right? File permissions that okay. gets both stored in the file system on the operating system, but also 
I'm sure many of our listeners have had it happen to them where they get a file from a hard drive from somebody who they're collaborating with at a distance and they can't open it or they can open it, but then nobody else in their work group can open it. And Jason, why is that? Well, that's because the permissions are stored as part of the basic, I don't know, Ben, why don't you tell me? <laughs> yeah, you know, you're, 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 you're there. Um, permissions are stored as part of those extended attributes. And so sometimes those right. files have what we call the POSIX permissions. Of course, we're, we're often running far afield already, um, but right. So <laughs> they often have an owner and a group and uh, something they call other and or world that says everybody can see this or only a select group of people in the workflow show can see it. It's only for Jason and Ben and nobody else can see it. Um, so we want to break it down that way. I sense a potential topic for a future episode of the workflow show uh, where we sort of break apart all of these file permission uh, frustrations that I know everyone listening mm -hmm. has. Right. Potentially more than many of, of the rest of you. <laughs> yes. Right. I know uh, we, often get, uh, we often get asked about permissions and why they're such a pain to deal with, but we can certainly uh, pick that apart in a future episode. But I think for, for this point right now that we're talking about, the important thing to remember is that the file data and the data about the file are two separate things. And mm -hmm. that will, uh, I think the, the reason we're mentioning that will become clear uh, very soon. So let's talk about how the data is stored on the actual uh, storage platform, whatever it is, if it's uh, uh, a SAN, a NAS. Uh, so data is stored in individual blocks on the storage, right? Yep. And they may not be sequential blocks. They might be scattered all over the storage, but that metadata about the file is what tells the machine, the system, the storage protocol, where to get that data from, how to put it all back together into an actual like coherent file, right? Yeah, for sure. If we're going to break it down even further, I mean, if you want, do you want to get really geeky on this? Well, yeah, okay. obviously. All right. So let's talk about hard disk drives first, right? Okay. Um, so we all know, and I don't, I don't think we love them, but we know them, right? They're these square little metal boxes. They're sealed, so you can't get any air in them. And what's inside those? We've or got dust. Or dust, yeah, right. So if you completely mess one up and need to get it repaired for $3,000, it has to go into a clean room where some crazy engineer will crack it open and then replace the internal component so that, God forbid, you can restore your data from it if it's even possible. But anyway, I digress. Right. So these magic little metal boxes... Inside of them, we have platters. And let's think about it as a tiny record player. We've got a it's a read, great way to think about it. Yeah, we've got a read-write arm that's a little mechanized arm that swings out, much like a record player, but it's driven by an, an instruction set that tells what's called the read-write head, which is a tiny magnet, where to go over this platter. So on these platters, the platters are coded with a metal film of microscopic metal grains on which data can be recorded as magnetic patterns formed by groups of those tiny grains. Okay, so let's remind everybody mm -hmm. that this data is an arrangement of magnetic particles. We've talked about this on the show before. Right. That data is represented on these physical media, like tape, like, like hard drives, mm -hmm. as an arrangement of magnetic particles. So go ahead, Ben. Right, yeah, and if you really want to mess with your head, Think about this. All day long, for years of your life, 20 years probably, what do you do? You rearrange magnetic particles. That's all you've been doing That's for right. 20 years. All you That's do right. is rearrange magnetic particles. It's really, though, about the ones and zeros. Okay, so we talked about HDD. Let's move on to some of the more modern forms of, of uh, random access storage, like SDDs, NVMe. Oh, I'm not um, done. So I'm not done with the You're not HDDs. Done. No, no. Oh. I, I'm going way deeper, Jason. Okay. So All right, go deep in. <laughs> <laughs> so each of these tiny grains, they're made up of groups that then forms the bits of data. Those bits of data are what form our bytes of data, which then form our kilobytes of data, which then form our ah. megabytes of data, which then form our gigabytes and our terabytes and petabytes of data. Um, 
Which, which is, is what we really care about, right? <laughs> correct. Which is what we really care about. For me, it always amazes me that this stuff even works, right? The idea of angels dancing on heads of pins always comes to mind. I don't know where that turn of phrase came from, but I always think about it when we think about storage medium. Because what's literally... I remember the person who taught me uh, who taught me the basics of how to clean a DAT deck back <laughs> in my uh, Audio 101 studio maintenance days. Nice. Uh, I remember him saying, if you... Once you get this apart and you look at how it treats the tape and pulls it out of the cassette and wraps it around the head, you'll wonder how we ever use this for a master. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And how it even works to begin with. Um, right. So what's happening there is that read-write head is magnetically realigning those particles into tiny groups, and that's what makes up our ones and zeros. That's what I was getting to, Ben, was the ones and zeros. That's because the Because while we were part. talking about arrangements of magnetic particles, really... We're really just talking about whether they're on or off, whether they're a zero or a one. Yes, correct. Or a one or a zero, to, to use the right order there. <laughs> right. And then once we've done that, then we read them back out magnetically, at least in the hard disk world, right. right? There's another separate arm that is just there like a record player to read instead of the grooves and vibrations. It's just reading the magnetic patterns on these spinning platters. And the funny thing about those platters is too, there's a read and write arm on top and bottom of each of those platters. And the bigger the hard drive is, the more platters there are. And so that's why, if you remember back in the day when hard drives used to live inside your laptop and you used to have to be very careful when you were moving around because you could feel them vibrate, they're spinning inside there at 5,400 RPMs, 7,200 RPMs, 10,000, 15,000 RPMs which is wickedly fast. Um, yeah, absolutely. Faster than the internal combustion engine in your automobile in most cases. So... Good point. Pretty fast. Now can we talk about SSDs? Okay. <laughs> All right. So SSDs, solid state disk or drive. Mm -hmm. is, there a, is there a preferred... It's not really a disk, so I'm going to say drive. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I like that. Um, disc always implies something so, that spins to me, right? Sure, yeah. So how are things different here? Like, we, we, we all know that SSDs are faster, right? Why is that? Um, so first, before we talk about SSDs, let's talk about their precursor, which is just good old RAM, random access memory. Okay. So random access memory, what we all... I'm going to say no and love again because RAM is awesome. RAM lets me have yeah. a thousand browser tabs open. It lets me use 20 um, software instruments at the same time. It lets us keep Premiere and After Effects open at the same time so we can tab through them quickly and round trip our workflows and do the things that we love to do um, and provides us with what I like to think of is... Um, it's like your office desk, right? It's like a really fast, imaginary office desk where you can spread out the things you need quickly in front of you, right? All the tools that you need, uh, you know, your pencil and your pad of paper, um, your car They're keys. They're all saved in RAM, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Right. That's awesome. They're all saved in RAM, right. And um, it's volatile. So what about the things that you... Uh, what, 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Oh, I was going to say, it's volatile memory, right? You're... Uh, you probably remember back to several years ago when you used to shut down your computer when you brought it back up. None of your programs were running like they were before. That's the way it used to be. And we take it for granted now that you close the lid on your laptop or you shut down your computer. And when it comes back up, all your programs are still sitting there the way they once were. Why is that? Because we write that into the cache before it goes to sleep because we have even fancier operating systems that do cool things. But anyway, I digress. RAM. So it's <laughs> volatile because um, as soon as you power it down, it loses everything. So it's just like uh, somebody with uh, long-term memory loss or Al Alzheimer's disease, right? It's only, sure. only the present is what matters. Everything else just falls to the wayside. It's like that movie Memento where he's got to tattoo himself with all of the things that oh, matter yeah. so that he can put his life back together and solve the mystery. So then I'm guessing you're segueing yes. into, into that. So that tattoo kind of is uh, what an SSD would be like. Right. So our friends, the SSDs in the solid state drive, one of the reasons we call them solid state is because they're 
obviously electronic. Um, the other is they're solid, right? There are no moving parts inside these buggers, um, which wow. means you can drop it and it'll probably still work. Whereas I don't know if you've ever had the experience of dropping a hard disk drive before and detonating the read write arm on the platter. <sighs> Yeah. That gives me chills yeah. thinking about that. Yeah. And then you've lost what back in the day used to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Um, and listeners, if that thought doesn't give you chills, you probably are less than, oh, 30. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. <laughs> back in okay. my day, we had to be careful <laughs> handling our hard disk drives. And if we dropped them, that was it. We needed a new one. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. And not only that, you lost everything on there, potentially. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So not a good situation. But right. SSDs are not without their... Um, yeah, well, let's just say one of the reasons we love SSDs is because they behave a lot like RAM in terms of how fast you can access the data that's stored on them, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we call it flash memory. Like I said, there's no moving parts. And how does it work? There are microscopic electron switches in these data storage devices, millions of transistors that are either on or off and remain so as long as electricity is applied to them in the system. SSDs use switches that are called floating gate transistors. Uh, these little buggers create special cages, that's the gate, um, that traps the electron flow within it. And that is a effectively why we can power down an SSD and it remembers what's on there, right? And that's the big uh -huh. thing. It's just like RAM. It's as fast as RAM. You can access it and it puts data where it can as fast as it possibly can, but it remembers what's on there where RAM doesn't. So it's non-volatile. Got it. Okay. That sounds really good, but SSDs are not without their their downfalls, right? Oh, sure. It yeah. sounds like it sounds like there could be uh, maybe a life expectancy on the functionality of those gates and all that stuff. Right? Yeah, so there's some challenges, right? One is obviously they're expensive. You know, we're talking about capacity sure. by way of comparison to traditional hard disk drives. Um, and while an SSD might be um, a whole lot faster, like three to five times faster, but there are caveats, right? Like if you don't apply electricity to it within a year, it forgets things and then you lose your files. You know, and it's, oh, that doesn't sound good. And it's the similar thing happens with the magnetics on hard drives, right? That's where one of the things we were yeah, saying we last talked about episode. That. Yeah, we did. We talked about that a little bit last time, how, uh, you know, it, it you should be spinning up your hard drives on a regular basis just to make sure that they spin up. Yep. Um, and just to kind of talk about a similarity with HDDs, in addition to that, is that to add capacity to these SSD drives, you're kind of like adding RAM chips, kind of like you're adding platters mm -hmm. on an HDD to get more capacity out of those. Right. So that's kind of a similarity, right? Right. And then you need something controlling the access to all of that. With the first couple generations of SSDs, those same control technologies were what we were using with hard disk drives because we just wanted to slot them into the same slots. Um, mm. So whether or not it was a SATA, um, or uh, SAS, right? SATA is the uh, Serial Advanced Technology Attachment, or SAS is Serial ah. Attached SCSI. Um, SCSI mm -hmm. is Small Computer Systems. Oh, man, I'm blanking on SCSI. Hold on. Small Computer System Interface. System interface. Okay. So what I just heard there mm -hmm. are another similarity between HDDs and SSDs is that they use the same interface to talk to the machine that is writing and reading the data. Right. Okay. So I'm hearing that there might be a new way <gasps> of communicating, <laughs> communicating with your storage and your machine. Yep. What would that be? NVMe. Non NVMe Memory Express. Okay. What's the deal with that? That sounds really cool. It is. And those buggers are wickedly fast. And when I say wickedly fast, I mean like three gigabytes a second or more, right? 
You probably remember back when you were working in production environments and you had your first storage area network and it was full of spinning disk hard drives and maybe there were they were rated together and maybe there were 48 of them in several drive chassis all humming together as one. And that in total gave you three gigabytes of aggregate performance spanning across all of those drives. Whereas now we have one thing because the interface on it is so fast and the silicone chips inside of it are so fast, we can now read and write data at the speeds of, you know, multiple hard drives that we had in the past. So that's really cool. That's why we can edit 4K off of our laptop or even 8K sometimes if we're, you know, judicious about how many streams we have. Got it. So it sounds like to sum all of that up, one of the reasons that NVMe is so much faster than than uh, HDD or SSDs is that uh, the analogy I would use is, is, is using a translator to translate between two different languages, okay? So if I could just do a mind meld with someone who spoke another language, that would be so much faster than, in, and than employing our native languages with the translator in between, right? You got it, right. So okay. the Express in NVMe is talking directly about the PCIe bus or the Peripheral Component Interconnect Express bus, which is how we slot cool I.O. cards or other cool audio cards or video cards or any sort of really neat components inside of a workstation or even how things like Thunderbolt work, right? Because Thunderbolt is just another port that speaks the same language just externally that we can then hook up another card that might be living in another chassis. And then there's this just this Thunderbolt port on it that is just doing the translation between the port and the card hiding inside the chassis. But what's great about that is that it can talk directly to the CPU and the other components on the bus. So like you said, they're taking out the middleman. It's going wicked fast and talking directly. Awesome. So that does sound like a mind meld. It is. All right, then. So let's move on from random access storage. And let's just like, I would say let's brush over a a little bit about something that is not so random access. So what about a linear type of storage? We will be talking about maybe tape there. Right. Okay, so tape would be a linear type of storage. L meaning that Go ahead. Sorry. L L. Thank you. <laughs> L is the is L is the first letter of linear. It's also the first letter of LTO, which is what, Ben? Linear tape. Oh, what the heck does the O stand for? <laughs> um Linear Tape Open. How could we forget the open, Jason? Linear tape open. Right. Thank you. So we're going back to a format that we, some of, some of us, I should say, know and love from our years of working with them. We don't have the ability to just drop in anywhere on, like we do on a spinning platter or, you know, a chip of random access memory. We actually have to start at the beginning and sort of read as we're going and say, and then get to the point where we actually need the data that we're looking for, right? You got it, right. The way I think about it is they're kind of like old VHS tapes, right? Mm -hmm. But instead of two spools, you just have one, right? They're these little square boxes that come in various capacities, right? There are various generations Mm -hmm. of LTO tape. The two really current, well, I should probably say three, LTO 6, 7, and 8 are currently um, in use and around on the market. And to some extent, LTO 5 is probably still in play too. Why do we still love these things? Because they're wickedly dense, right? So a single LTO 6 tape is 2.5 terabytes. A single LTO 7 tape is 6 terabytes. An LTO 8 tape is 12 terabytes worth of information. And coming soon to a storage vendor near you. Tape library near you. (laughs) Right, exactly. Uh, LTO 9, which is 24 terabytes per tape. So great. So let's buy a bunch of those and edit off of them, right? (laughs) That's all we need, isn't it? I mean, it's going to be a little slower, but no, I'm guessing that's not the case, right? That's not a thing. No, it's, it's a really good backup medium. It's a really good archive medium. So just like our old videotapes, like 
back in the DV days or the beta days, they have a shelf life of 10 to 20 years. And so that's why they're still used. And people have been saying that tape is dead for 10, 20 years now. And every year they come up with new variations of it. Every year people still keep using it because for the capacity by way of comparison to a hard drive, if you're paying $200 for, say, a 12 terabyte LTO8 tape, it's a whole lot cheaper than $1,000 for an enterprise class 12 terabyte hard drive, right? Sure, um, yeah. And you can pack them, like you said, full of a library. Now, what's that library all about? It's a giant box of air with shelves that tape sits in there. And then there's a fancy little robot with a fun little arm that goes and reads barcodes and sticks those tapes into the drives. And that's where we read them. And like you said, they're linear, meaning that if you want a specific file off of it, we've got to get the instruction set from a database to say, where is that file? And then we read the barcode to say, oh, it's on this tape, on this shelf. The robot goes and gets it, sticks it in the drive, and forwards the tape drive to that spot where it knows where that file is located. And that's why it takes ah. so long to restore things from Glacier. So let's go back real quick and mention that I had said something earlier in the episode that I want people to remember, which is that the file data and the data about the file are stored in different places. Yes. So here's a perfect example of that. Your file data is stored on that LTO tape, but where that file is located, where the data about that file is located, uh, may not be on the tape itself. It may be in some database somewhere that the archive system is managing or the backup system is managing. Yep. Um, and hopefully so, you have a systems administrator who is also smart enough to back up that database onto one of those tapes just in case the server uh, goes down. Good point. Good point. Let's continue uh, the discussion about this linear tape format because there's another format out there that is that is that is linear that we should briefly mention. Uh, linear tape file system or LTFS. Oh, right? this is something that I think a lot of people. Go ahead. I was going to say, here's where you prove yourself wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So this is this is a different protocol than LTO because we are actually storing both of those sets of data, the file data itself and the data about the file, where to access it itself, on the tape itself. So this is much more akin to what you would see in an HDD or SSD situation where, you know, and we're talking about the HDD or, S or SSD that lives in your, your actual machine. The file data and the data about the file are all stored on that. So you need that that pool of storage and something that understands and can interpret it to be able to read it. So with LTFS, you need an LTO drive, a tape drive, and you also need to be able to read that directory information, that metadata off of the drive itself. So the reason we want to talk about this is because it can seem to be a really cool thing to have a desktop LTFS drive where you can just throw a tape in and start copying files off. And it it would be a great thing, except we need to remember that every time you write that data, a new set of metadata is written to that tape mm -hmm. at the end of it, in addition to the data that you just wrote. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we want to avoid with LTFS is filling it up with lots of different directory entries. So we don't want to be in a situation where, uh, oh, at the end of the day, we, we created uh, maybe 150 megabytes of content, and we're just going to then write it to the LTFS drive just to make sure we got it on there. And we do that over the course of two months. So what you've got now is 60 different spots on that tape that have information about the data on that tape. And the process of getting that data back can be very, very, very slow. Right. What, we, what we tend to see in situations where LTFS works really well is if there is a cache in front of that LTFS, if it's a hard drive or some, somewhere where you can sort of stage that content for writing to the LTFS, mm. then you write all that content in, like, let's say you've got a, you know, a seven terabyte uh, or eight terabyte or whatever uh, LTFS tape. Um, it helps if you cache all of that information to some sort of random access media before you write it then to the LTFS. It's not to say that you can't um, do separate writes. It just seems to work so much better when you do all the writes at once than when you go back to read that data off. It only has to read from one or two or three different spots on the tape to show you even what's on the tape. Right. Good data hygiene, friends. Great data hygiene. Okay, well, let's move on. Do uh, you have anything else to say about LTFS? Um, yeah, it doesn't do well with spanning. 
right? We can't ah, span point. files sure. between two LTFS tapes. What we really need is something governing, the, an intelligence governing those reads and writes to say, like, I know, and this is where, Jason, you were talking about, you know, we're doing our little bit of... Uh, pre-archive uh, work. To staging? Staging, preparation. exactly, right. So we know we have 12 terabytes to write on this. So we better make sure that before we write to there, we have just 12 terabytes to write because if we get to the end of it and then it barfs and says, no more for you, then you're a very sad person. Right, right. Well, let's move on from linear mm-hmm. and talk about Clustered storage. So this is a uh, clustered storage would be lots of different pools of storage working together as one. Yes. For what reasons? Why would we want that? There's two primary reasons, and that takes us back to the 1970s and 80s. Back in the 70s, um, our friends, the computer scientists, figured out that once they had these hard drives that they had created, and I think the first one was what, IBM in 1956 or 65? I don't know. One of those years, I'm dyslexic. Um, So they figured out how to write magnetically to these amazing platters. And then they figured out that these platters fail. Um, And so they figured out, well, we better have a way of writing it to more than one. And we better have a way of protecting our data against faults or losses. And so we get a data protection scheme. And so the first one that we typically see is mirroring, meaning I'm writing the same piece of data to two drives instead of one. Um, When we're talking about RAID, what raid <laughs> right it's it's what we used to kill bugs with and probably still do but it's also how we <laughs> save our data um it's a redundant array of independent disks now the fun piece of history there is that there was a group of computer scientists at Berkeley in the 80s that first presented a paper called A Case for Redundant Arrays of Inexpensive Disks, which makes total sense because what their hypothesis was is that you have more disks spinning together, you get more speed rather than putting all of your money into building just a faster one of whatever it was, right? However, our friends in marketing and sales said inexpensive We're not calling it inexpensive. Let's call it independent. So that's... Because nobody loves expensive. Right. And everybody loves dependent. (laughs) Right. And everybody loves to make money from selling things. Sure. So we'll talk about our RAID levels. Okay. Um, RAID levels. So we're talking about RAID 0, RAID 5, RAID 6. Yeah, right. So what the heck is that all about? Why don't we talk about RAID 1, which you already kind of mentioned. Sure. So RAID 1 is just simple mirroring. It's you're writing the same piece of data to two locations. And what happens if one of those hard disks fails? You have another. So where do we use this all the time? We like to use it in boot drives, right? We like to use it in simple backup uh, situations, right? Um, You can think of even something like Time Machine, even though it really isn't RAID, it's kind of a one-to-one if you're running it properly, right? Even though there's some other fun hijinks that it does. You have a second copy. The second copy is what's important because if if things don't live in more than one place or if things don't exist in more than one place, they don't exist at all. Right. And in, in a RAID 1 situation, we're actually writing to both disks at once. Correct. Simultaneously. Um mm-hmm. So that gets us to another idea in and around that, which is striping or spanning, okay. which we start thinking of in and around RAID 0. Now, RAID 0, what we get with this striping, meaning that we're writing data, um, not the same piece of data to two drives. We're writing one, say you're writing one file, half goes on one drive, the other half goes to the other drive. And so what happens there is that you're, when you're reading it back, it's twice as fast. Or if you're writing yeah, it, it's twice like as fast. Yeah, it sounds like that could be a lot faster. It yeah. is, right. And so for years and years and years, everybody had the G-Check drive that they were working off of, of Firewire or Thunderbolt. And that really was the fastest thing that as a small um, independent video editor, you were able to eke out 100 megabytes a second. 
or 130 or 40 megabytes a second. And that really was able to get some real work done versus a single solitary hard drive, which was maybe 80 megabytes a second. Gotcha. So when do we start talking about how we can put all these together and sort of like share them with other people? So let's talk about bigger arrays then, right? So Okay. What we're talking Bigger about... Bigger than GTEC drives. Yeah, so what we're talking about with RAID 0 and RAID 1, those are small buggers, right? That's two drives at least. You want to add mm-hmm. a third drive so we have more capacity and more speed. That's when we get into RAID 5. And that introduces another new piece of data called parity data. Ah, I was going to say, it sounds like we're, we might also be introducing more redundancy. It's as redundant as RAID 1, RAID 5 is, because okay. you're adding an additional stripe of data on there that allows you to describe um, what's missing. So imagine, if you will, you've got a piece of data being written to three hard drives instead of two. However, when all of these writes happen, there's also another piece of data, and maybe that, mm, and this is a good point. So if we have a RAID 5, we'll get the capacity of two drives, and that third drive will typically allow us to have the parity data written to it. So okay, there is a capacity hit there. While we get better performance and better protection, we lose capacity, which means if, say, we have, say they're all 10 terabyte drives, three of them together, the raw capacity is 30 terabytes, but as soon as we rate five it, it's 20 terabytes. So you lose a good bit there. Okay. But what that means is we've got three of these things spinning together and they're fast, but if I lose one, we still have the ability to reconstruct the data that was there before because okay. we have this magic parity data. Got it. So with RAID 6, we get even more of that parity. That's right. With RAID 6, we have double parity. So RAID 6 requires at least four drives. And so two of those drives in the set become parity data. Well, it makes it sound like there's just parity data being written to those drives, which it isn't. The way parity data works is that all of the chunks of data are written across all four drives. But say if one of those drives there's enough data describing what's missing through what they call um, an XOR. Um, And we're not going to get into the fancy maths about how that works, but it's a way of figuring out what bits are missing using binary data. And so you can reconstruct what was there. So I've got these... So that's the whole idea of we lost a drive, we're rebuilding the RAID. Correct, right. right. In in RAID 5, we we can lose one drive. However, in RAID 6, we can lose two drives. And so that's where we can have a RAID 5 array that has, say, maybe eight drives or 16 drives, or same thing with RAID 6. It isn't just four drives. It can be 18 drives or 14 drives. Um, mm-hmm. And those all spin together and work as a single group, which then data is written across. We were talking about blocks before, right? Data is striped across all of these drives using the same block size so that the chunks of data are written simultaneously or read from simultaneously across every drive in that group, which is kind of magic. Well, that sounds awesome, Ben. So let's talk about how we can like put all of these drives together and actually use them in an environment where lots of people can actually work on the files that are on them. Okay. Right? Yep. So we're talking about SAN and NAS. And... We have an episode on that, too. We do. Look up the episode on SAN versus NAS. Many, many, many people that I have talked to have said, hey, the episode on SAN versus NAS, it's so good. Please listen to it. It really dispels a lot of myths about uh, what these two things are. So we don't want to get too deep into what they are, but we are going to bring up, we're, we're, we're going to sort of high-level talk about what they are. Take it from there, Ben. Okay, so <laughs> we've got our drives. Say we're using RAID 6 because... Um, we like the parity. We like that it's durable, meaning that there's less of a chance for things to die. To speak about that briefly, one drive worth of parity is good if you have a small volume. Like where, So I think it's worth talking about why and where would we use RAID 5, right? We might use mm-hmm. that if I'm an editor, I'm at home, I want something that is of a decent capacity that I can use for my own personal work, 
but I also want something that is protecting my data in some way, shape, or form, right? So maybe it's a GTEC drive or maybe a promise, like a promise Pegasus, right? And maybe it's mm-hmm. six drives in the chassis. And maybe I don't want to lose too much capacity because I spent nearly $1,000 on this thing and I want as much capacity as I can get. So I'm only going to use one of those drives in that cluster for the parity data. And maybe I'm just, I just haven't bothered thinking about it and this is the way it was shipped to me. There's already a file system on it. I could just plug it in and use it, right? So at least there's some mm-hmm. level of uh, protection there, right? Which is good. It's better than no protection. It's better than RAID 0 because if one of those drives in a, in a RAID 0 set fails, all of the data is gone. Um, so if you've got RAID 0 drives out there, back them up to something else. Please, dear God, back them up. This is another thing I wanted to cover, and I'm glad we're still talking about RAID because I want to make it very clear for our listeners. Please, if you don't take anything away from this episode, please take this away. RAID does not equal backup. Correct. Okay? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it again. A RAID is not a backup. It is protection, but it is not a backup of your data. Right. It means that you can lose a drive inside of that unit and still work. Now, you should immediately swap that drive out and let it rebuild. But the other thing that's worth mentioning here and now is that um, hard drives age. There's something that happens called bit rot or bit flips, where after a while, weird things happen. Maybe it's cosmic rays, maybe it's something else, but... These tiny uh, bits inside of our metal platters, they flip by themselves. Maybe somebody's um, making the evil eye and sending you uh, uh, some weird energy or whatever it is. So think good thoughts around your storage, people. Think good thoughts. But so yeah, and it's I mean you know this is another this is yet another way that uh, the data storage devices can deteriorate over time. I mean we've talked about tape shedding oxide and mm-hmm. uh, we've talked about uh, we've talked about the electricity sort of. Mm-hmm. You know, leaking out of the SSDs. So yep. this is, you know, this is another way that yet, you know, yet another way that we can sort of lose data over time that we just have to be mindful of. Right. Um, the main guiding principles for me here is how long are the hard drives warranted? Right. If they're an enterprise class hard drive, they're usually warranted for five years. It's safe to use them for those five years. If they're not an enterprise class drive, um, usually it's two or three years worth of a warranty that they come with. Um, they might last longer. They might not. What's the big difference between an enterprise class drive and a non-enterprise class drive? Well, the warranty. The warranty. They're usually the same drives with very similar components. It's just that. One has been tested before it leaves the facility, or I should say they're all tested before they leave the facility. However, with the enterprise class drives, um, they pass a higher standard of testing so that we know they're a little bit more reliable and resilient. Anyway, that gets us back to the the land of data faults and about drives failing. And one of the things that I'm, it's worth taking the time to talk about What happens when you've got a group of, let's say, 16 hard drives, they've been sitting in your RAID array, you work in a facility, and nobody has replaced the storage for six years, and those hard drives are kind of old, and now one of the drives has died, and now all of the drives are trying to rebuild to the spare drive in the chassis. That's something we didn't really mention, but yes, we can have spare drives in the chassis, meaning that as soon as one drive fails, it immediately begins to rebuild the data from that RAID set using the parity data that tells us um, out of all of these drives what's missing, and we can go and recreate it there. What happens then when our drives are old and then all of that read activity is happening from our old drives simultaneously and we have a second fault? You know, we've got a RAID 6 volume. We were smart enough to do that. Now we've got two drives that have failed. Because all of our drives are old, the likelihood during a read and write intensive exercise where all of these drives are reading as fast as they can to spin the data back onto this one spare drive so that it can be safe again, sometimes 
one of the ways I like to describe it to clients is it's like you have a group of tribal elders and they're walking together and they hold all the knowledge of the tribe and then suddenly a dinosaur shows up and the dinosaur is chasing them and then one of them dies and now they're quickly trying to share the tribal knowledge with all of the rest of the elders and then another one dies because they're running really fast and he has a heart attack and then they're all running together and then what happens if another one dies? You've lost all the tribal knowledge. It sounds like a failure cascade. Correct. Would yeah. be a great way to describe that. Yeah. Right. So um, don't let your tribal elders be eaten by dinosaurs. No, definitely not. This is a scenario where you may want to like start swapping some of those older drives out. Yes. Right? Yeah. So five years is a good benchmark. You need to plan ahead in terms of your budget life cycles to say that every five years, maybe every five to seven years, depending upon the manufacturer's warranties. Like if you're keeping the manufacturer's warranty up and those those rate arrays, they're still under warranty and not end of life and end of support, especially, and somebody is still willing to warranty it, that's another guiding factor that you can use to keep things around for a little bit longer. But five to seven, seven years is really the max. And there's all sorts of factors that play into whether or not those drives live for longer life like is it cool in your data center do you have proper cooling in there um because the hotter things are the quicker they die so anyway where were we i completely lost it thinking about dinosaurs (laughs) we were about to talk about what happens when you put all of these raids together oh and right share them right how do we do that organization right how do we do that well we either have a san or a nas right right we do so that brings us back to file systems again, right? Because we've got these underlying RAID volumes, and then we've got a file system on top of it, which is our kind of treasure map. And we need a treasure map that everybody can read. And so there's a couple of different ways we can do that. One in the world of, let's say, NAS. So we're talking specifically here about shared storage, where we want... Shared storage. Yep. We want to have... um, a file system that's living on top of what will what is still going to be direct attached storage right because in a nas situation we have a server um, which is making its storage available to everybody. So say we've got a RAID array and it's attached to a, a server head. Um, that server head is then It has all the bandwidth available of all those drives, right? And so if each of those drives is worth 150 megabytes a second, and we've got 16 or 24 or 36 of those buggers all humming together, and maybe they're in um, three or four different uh, groups of drives or uh, RAID sets together, um, we need something that's going to tell all of those drives to spin together as one, to read and write together as one, and that's the file system layer. And then when we talk about the NAS layer, which is kind of another file system on top of the file system. Yeah, it is. Sure. Yeah. It's actually virtualizing the file system. Right. 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 And so it's a way of sharing folders and files that are going to be stored on that underlying direct attached storage on that server. However, Jason, you and I are going to be able to share those files within the office or maybe even from our very own homes if we have a nice connection back to the office and we've spent um, all the money per month on our uh, internet bills. (laughs) But only because we are talking to that machine. Correct. That has that storage connected, right? Right, yeah. We often call them a gateway or a file server, right? And what we're talking about is file sharing protocols like SMB or server message block or NFS, the network file system, or... Or AFP, Apple file protocol. Yeah, from back in the day. We're not using that anymore. Back in the day. Yeah, Apple kind of said that's not a thing. So use SMB two or three. Um, Virtualizing a file system is essentially obfuscating the block level layer of storage from the clients or the machines that are actually trying to read and write to that storage. And we're presenting a virtualized version of that file system. Right. So essentially another translation layer uh, that that we could call that. Yep, exactly. And this um, 
from most of our earliest memories of a server. You know, it's a file server that, you know, maybe it was your first office job and somebody said, oh, you'll have access to this folder on the server. And that's where you'll put all your files. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're just Word documents, right? Um, Nowadays, maybe it's OneDrive that your organization is using, or maybe you're file sharing via Box. Or maybe you're still using a network file server in some traditional sense to share smaller Word files and stuff like that. But one of the limiting factors on a file server like that is the network interface because it only has an amount of bandwidth itself to share the direct attached storage that it has mounted out to all of the users, right? And so we only have one port or two ports, and they're only as fast as those ports are. It could be one gigabit, 10 gigabit, 40 gigabit, maybe 100 gigabit, which means it's a lot faster. But still, there's only one door in and out of that building. So if you want to get more files in and out of that building, and I say building as a way of thinking about the storage back end of the Mm -hmm. file server. That's the um, virtualized storage that we're sharing betwixt each other. Mm -hmm. If that door is small and that data is large, that's when we find things failing. And that, my friends, is why we can't edit off of the corporate office file server. It's, it sounds like it's kind of like a, a good analogy would be um, there's a party on the top floor of the building, but you need to take the elevator to get there. And everybody wants to get into that party. So everybody's waiting in the lobby to take that elevator. That's a much nicer kind of way thing. of thinking about it. I always think about a fire in the building and everybody's trying to get out. I like your analogy <laughs> much better. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So we we often talk about scale out NASs, which to me, and the way I always think about a scale out NAS is it's kind of like a raid where you've got, instead of having a bunch of drives all connected together to present one pool of storage or one chunk of storage, you've got a bunch of RAIDs, like a bunch of actual chassis that you're using to present the NAS, and you can add more later if you run out of space. You got it. So let's think about scale out versus scale up. So one of the things that we can do with a NAS volume is to add a JBOD. What's a JBOD? Just a bunch of disks, friends. It's kind of like a dumb, you know, hey, here's a bunch more storage for you to Right. It's usually attached via SAS. And what is SAS? Our serial attached. Serial attached. SCSI. (laughs) SCSI? Is that what it is? SCSI, yeah, SCSI. Okay. Yeah. And so which it's it's just a fast little cable that connects between the two chassis. And so essentially say you've got a say you've got a NAS server that has 36 hard drives in it in a RAID controller and a 100 gigabit NIC. And then you add another chassis to it. We're scaling it up. We're adding that JBOD. What's the bottleneck, Jason? What's the bottleneck? The bottleneck is the controller the the actual thing that you're adding the jbod to yes you're right the gateway server the nas server whatever we want to call it that controller head specifically the network interface card which is sharing all of the underlying direct attached storage out with the end user that is the bottleneck so that's our elevator those are our front doors if those aren't big enough to get our files in and out what happens we lose files well we don't lose them but we drop frames and our edits don't work and everybody is unhappy so that's why we need to be able to scale out which means we add more servers and then there has to be an additional control layer which allows us to add those additional servers so that we have more NICs and more gateways and more underlying storage that all hums together as one and then lets things go faster for more people to work with simultaneously. So that sounds like uh, adding a second building or a third building next to our original building and with, with their own elevators and creating some, maybe some bridges on the top floor where that party is. You got it. Welcome to party uh, Between those buildings. You got it. Right. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about a SAN and how that differs. Now, we do have a whole episode on, on SAN versus NAS from the past, which you should listen to if you haven't. Uh, it's, it's very informative, but we're just kind of covering some basics here. Yep. Uh, in a SAN, it's still a shared pool of storage, but that block-level data happens over one connection or one protocol, 
And the communication about the block level data, again, here we talk about the fact that these are separate. The data itself is separate from the data about the data. That happens over another protocol, right? Right. So in a clustered file system, in a true clustered file system, and there's a couple out there, um, Storenext, Quantum Storenext, uh, the SNFS, Storenext file system, or um, Blue Whale, which is the BWFS, Blue Whale file system. These are two clustered SAN file systems. We're big Storenext heads at Chesapeake Systems and have been purveyors and believers in the technology for a long time. As Jason was mentioning, we've got what I like to think of as our metadata controllers, our traffic cops. So these are similar to our NAS heads in that there's some sort of a control mechanism going on about the data. But really the huge difference between SANS and NASs is, is that a SAN using, let's say, fiber channel is the protocol, and fiber channel is um, a really traditional communications protocol that spits as much data as it possibly can over the wire, right? These are optical cables that go to your workstation, and they're 8 gigabits or 16 gigabits or 32 gigabits a second, and you get almost line-level speed on them, and they're wickedly fast because it's all block-level. So what does that mean, block-level? Well, we talked about it before, it's block storage, and it acts just like it's a direct attached hard drive. And because it's a direct attached hard drive, it's just that much faster. But what happens if, Jason, you and I both mount the same direct attached hard drive's internal storage and don't have a control layer to mount to it, and we're both writing to the same sectors in the same disk at the same time? I think that's called a data collision. Yeah. What happens to that file? Uh, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes corrupted. We don't want that. So that's why we have metadata controllers. These metadata controllers are what I like to think of as traffic cops that avoid data collisions. And they... Al- so everybody talks to those as well. Mm-hmm. You got it. And so there's an independent metadata network um, that connects. If it's a fiber channel, there's a second line going to each of these workstations. That's another one gigabit Ethernet connection that is the data about the data and tells you where those files are located. But more importantly, who's writing to what, when, where, why, and how. So that we don't get collisions and that everybody can mount the underlying RAID storage as if it's their own, meaning that there's no interaction with another layer and that, say, I've got, I don't know, four RAID arrays? You know, say we've got half a petabyte worth of storage and there's four RAID arrays there and maybe there's 128 disks and we've got five gigabytes worth of aggregate bandwidth available to everybody. That's where we get into really productive shared storage environments. And that's one of the reasons we really yeah. like SANS. SANS are cool. Yeah. I mean, it really is kind of like everybody's working on the same hard drive that's just inside their computer. Yep. Which is pretty awesome. Because yeah, they are. That's right. Yep. All right. So listeners, we have thrown a lot of really cool data at you. We have some more to talk about in terms of storage. So we're actually going to break the second part of this discussion about storage into a future episode that we will be presenting to you in the span of probably a week or two. Uh, We want to get these out for you. All right. So let's just do a quick recap on what we talked about here. Uh, We started talking through uh, the different types of random access storage, hard disk drives, solid state drives, SSDs, NVMe. And we talked a little bit about linear, so tape-based storage. We talked about clustered storage, how to put these drives together into a RAID uh, and what that entails. And the takeaway there, remember, a RAID is not a backup. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about how to put all of these RAIDs together into a shared system, whether that be a SAN or a NAS and the sort of technologies that underlie those. So in the next episode of The Workflow Show, we're going to talk about object storage, whether that be on-premise or in the cloud, uh, and how that is sort of different from the file systems that you all might be used to. What else are we going to talk about? Well, we're also going to talk about tiering of storage between production, maybe nearline, archive. We'll talk a little bit about disaster recovery and business continuity. And Uh, We'll also talk about how you can sort of tweak and tune, or how I should say we could sort of tweak and tune your storage solution to your needs. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Jason. And thank you for listening to The Workflow Show. We love producing this podcast, and we hope you enjoy it too. So let us know what you think. 
If you have any stories or questions or anecdotes about asset management, media storage, media infrastructure, or integrations, or you just want some workflow therapy, get in touch with us. Email us at workflowshow at chessa.com. And as always, you can visit our website anytime, chessa.com. Thanks for listening. I'm Jason Whetstone.